Welcome to another episode of Locker Room Raw, a special edition of Locker Room Raw because it's not every day that you get to sit down with an NBA player. We've got Keith Kloss in the house, otherwise known as Boss Kloss. How you doing, brother? How's it going? Another day in paradise. Glad to be here. This is paradise, but uh, we're here to talk about you. So let's get started with no wasting time. Um, born in Hartford, Connecticut, correct? Right. But moved West Coast at a very young age. Five years um, old. Ended up well. You, you. Uh, I know from you know just doing my research that you're from the the Hartford Projects, but you ended up in a similar type area in the West Coast version of that, which is a whole other story because of the gang affiliations and all of that. But I'll let you tell your own story. So from what I understand, you know, you you you, you had some issues over there, got separated from your family at some point. Why don't you fill the people in on the blanks and just tell them about yourself and where you come from, bro? Yeah, I'm a project baby out of Hartford, Connecticut, you know, out of Bellevue Square Housing Project. Uh, a very big and yet close-knit community. Okay. You know, uh, we had other athletes, Michael Adams, okay. who uh, at one point in time led the NBA in three-point Are you talking about little Michael Adams yeah. to play for Denver? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, who else? Uh, Marcus Camby. He uh, lived obviously, yeah, he lived UMass. downstairs from me. Yeah, yeah, we were schoolmates for for a short while. Uh, we had a host of other people who came from there as well. Okay, you know, boxing, football. So, yeah. Okay, and uh, once you had been Los Angeles, what were the challenges of you know leaving where you where you've always known to end up in an area where what what block you come from really matters, what neighborhood you come from really matters, right. and the challenges of just navigating through that. You know what the first the first great challenge for me was the the air quality, the difference in air quality. <laughs> oh, that West Coast smog? <laughs> yeah, that smog, man. Okay. You know, coming from New England where the, the air is nice and clean to the West Coast where now your your nostrils are on fire. Every every breath you take, you right. know, you feel like you're short of breath. And that was the first major adjustment. Okay. You know, after that, everything else was pretty much smooth sailing. As far as school life, you had the same things, you know, that went on at every school. You got right. school bully, you got the school jock, you got the school comedian, you know. Uh, but yeah, moving to a, a an area that was very volatile as far as the gang violence. Right. You know, uh, for years I couldn't sleep in, unless I heard gunfire or the helicopter overhead. You know, because I, that became, that's what let me know everything was gonna be okay. Okay. You know, until then, that, that, that stillness, that quiet in the air, it was just very uneasy for me. So, you know, and it's still like that a little bit today. I have to have something in the background. So I fall asleep watching TV. Man, that sounds almost like a PTSD type type that's exactly uh, description of, of, of your childhood, which is which is serious. That's a, that's a pretty elaborate way of describing it. Um, so what led you to basketball? Because I know you've mentioned that in other interviews that, you know, you used to get into fights. You, you've had to change schools a lot. And at what point did basketball uh, help you out? And and tell just tell us about how rough it was just being separated from your family. I'm, I'm sure that was not easy, especially at a very young age. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And God bless my mom. You know, she did a tremendous job. You know, she left first. She left for a year to establish roots in Los Angeles and then came back for me, myself and my sister. It was just two of us at the time. Okay. And uh, she had two more boys who came along later. You know, two more brothers coming on later. And, um, you know, so shout out to my mom for doing a hell of a job of raising us and making sure we had everything that we needed. But it, it was crazy, man, because, uh, you know, for one instance to the next, you never knew what was going to happen, you know, and just hearing those tires screeching and bending the block. And, you know, is it is it friendly or is it hostile? Right. You know, what is it? And heads constantly on a swivel, you know, and, we had to move around a lot because of try, my mother trying to protect us from that environment, okay. trying to keep us away from it. She didn't want any of us falling into it. And she had no idea about my own affiliations until later down the line. Okay. You know, because I, I just kept it from everybody else. And you I know. assume your mom was working to her. I heard she worked oh, for the yeah, city, yeah, right? Yeah, she worked for City Hall since I was maybe seven years old, you know. Um, but basketball, man, it was definitely a life changer for me and it didn't hurt that I continued to grow I was already taller than everybody but of course to every year grow four or five inches you know it was it was a it was a, a pain 
you know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like literally and, and, and metaphorically. I yeah, yeah, saying. it was growing pains for real. I mean, first of all, just being where you're from, any when you stand out for any reason, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, and I'm Absolutely. sure that your height made people think you're a lot older than you were because that used to happen to me. And I'm not, I, you're a foot taller than I am. I had the baby I mean? so, face. I had the baby right, face. Right, right. So, okay, you know, okay, okay. so I was still getting carded at 25. Okay, okay. You Even know? though you were already yeah. seven feet. So I got yeah. you. I got you. Okay. Right, right. So, um, but did that help or hurt you though? Did they think you were soft because you had the baby face though? No, they didn't think I was soft. Okay, and, you know, because I I was a I was a proactive type of person. Okay, you know, it, it's either fight or flight, and I'm a fighter, okay. so I'm gonna get down where I stand, you know, and whatever comes with it, that's what comes with it, you know, just the clip, you know, the viral clip, mm-hmm. fight or flight, and gotcha. I wasn't gonna run. I so gotcha. I gotcha. yeah, yeah. A uh, question I have to ask you, because it's just something that I always think about. Because you're, I'm assuming by the time you were 13, you were well over six feet tall. You're probably closer to like six, oh, five. Six, oh, six, six, two. Six, two, exactly. Yeah. So at 16, how tall were you? Six, eight. So my question is, did you play basketball because you were tall or did you love the game? No, I loved it. I loved it as far back as I can remember. You know, I've always had a basketball in my hand. It was either a basketball or a football because of my family. They play basketball and football. Okay, gotcha. You know, so uh, but basketball that was my that was my main thing, you know. And when we couldn't when we couldn't access the courts because of the the bigger kids or the adults were on the courts, mm-hmm. uh, it was nothing to go ahead and hook up a, a milk crate to the laundry to line or post. yeah or to a tree and you know that's where that's where we were at you know, and that's that's where the best shooters come from, you know. People ask people were surprised that I can shoot. Right. I was like, well, it got started on a milk crate. Right. Because you, know, right. you have to be accurate to knock down a jump shot, you know, in a milk crate. It's true, bro. I used to struggle with those milk crates. I mean, where I come from, they didn't use a milk crate. But when I would go down to Brooklyn and stay with my cousins, I, I that, that shit used to amaze me that they was playing on milk crates. But yeah. that showed you how much people love the game that they weren't going to let anything stop them from playing, right? Right. So, we didn't even let the elements stop us. You know, out there with frostbite, you know, <laughs> little boots on right, out there right, balling, right. you know. So the NBA, so at some point you get, actually, before we get to the NBA, let's talk about your college experience because most people probably don't know this. You're still to this day the all-time leader in shots, uh, block shots per game at what, 5.9 is it? Yeah. And you had a season of 6.4? Yeah. That doesn't even sound like a real number. That sounds like, it's like you were out there playing volleyball on these cats. Like, Right, right. um, I'm sure that at that time, uh, that got you a lot of attention because the school that you chose, which is the next question I want you to answer, uh, is not known for basketball. So being from L.A. where you have, you know, infinite amount of choices of schools, what made you go back to the East Coast, back to, to Connecticut? Everybody kept wanting to uh, redshirt me because I was so so slim. You know, when I graduated from high school, I was maybe 175, 180 pounds. How tall were you? 7'2". Whoa. You know, I grew a, I grew another inch during my freshman year in college. Okay, so you're skin but, and bones back then. Yeah, <laughs> all right, yeah, all right, right, right. All skin and bones. So, like I said, the colleges they wanted to redshirt me. Okay. You know, and uh, the Central they promised that I'd be able to play right away, which is important to every player. Exactly, right? exactly. And you know, I'm from the era where, you know, the big man is supposed to be underneath the basket doing this and that. But I grew up playing all five positions. Okay. okay. You know, I was a six eleven two man. Okay. In AAU, okay, okay. Yeah, Andre Miller was my point guard. You know, basic game, Andre Miller, but, yeah. one of the one of the most underrated ever. Absolutely. Led the league in assists, I'm sure, at least once or twice. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. Very high IQ guy. You know, I was actually supposed to go to Utah with him, but oh damn, with uh, play for Rick Majerus. Didn't yeah. Keith Van Horn play on that team too? Yeah. Oh, and y'all see, would have been a problem. And uh, and Brandon Jesse, Mike Doliak was with them as well. Play for Orlando. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, you guys had a couple NBA players on that team. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, it, w- it, it would have been nice. But they wanted, like I said, they wanted to redshirt me, not understanding the makeup of my metabolism. You know? Oh, you're saying that's the reason you were skinny is not because you didn't yeah. want to work. It's because. Right, it's just my metabolism. I got you. You know, I, if my mother let me, I would have ate our family out of <laughs> house and home. You know. Like any teenager, right? Right, right. But, uh, yeah, so Central, they're going to allow me to play from day one. And then it allowed me the opportunity to be back around family members that I hadn't seen in a while. How close you know, is it to where you grew up? 
15 minutes. Oh, damn. Yeah, so 15 I mean, minutes. Okay, that makes, that makes way more sense that you would then choose that school. Right. I got right. you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they promised that, you know, you, you would be the center of the team because, again, it wasn't a basketball first school and all that. Well, you know, the one thing that my, my coach did promise me was that if I listened to him, mm-hmm. I'd lead the nation in shot blocking. Oh, he called it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he called it. He said, um, if you listen to me, if you do everything I ask you to do, right. give me your career best effort every game, mm-hmm. you lead the nation in shot blocking. You know, okay. because I, I was able to do everything so well. I was a ball handler. I can pass. I can shoot. You know, he actually taught me how to play in the post. My AAU coach, Jim Espinosa, he was the first one to, you know, start working with me on a hook shot, really. Gotcha. Like, to really get me to focus on it around 10th grade, 11th grade. But other than that, I was always on the perimeter. You know, I, I was used to always having a ball in my hands. You know, so once I got to college, that's where I learned how to how to play back to the basket. Got you. Okay. And is there any reason you only played two seasons? Yeah. They screwed over my, uh, my coach, and uh, I was going to transfer up out of there, and they messed up my transcripts to make sure that I stay. Oh, sit for real? Yeah. Yeah. I found that out that's down the wild. line. And, you know, all of a sudden I was ineligible. I was like, wow, that's strange. You know, I at least had a high C average. Right. You know? Okay. But uh, I was going to actually go back to Utah, you know, and join up with Andre. Okay. And uh, it was. Y'all either- were still in contact at that time? No, we weren't. Okay. We weren't. Okay. But, you know, it's basketball. So. Right. It, it, I mean, I still, I'm still friends with dudes I played with 20 years ago. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I don't see them, but we still, we still talk right. all the time. So I get you. Right. It was either going to be Utah or go down to, uh, to uh, South Florida with uh, Seth Greenberg, who was at Long Beach State, who had recruited me at Long Beach State. Okay, so, I got you. Okay. Yeah. But those were the two coaches that I felt most comfortable with outside of my own coach that I signed with initially. Right. Okay. You know, Seth Greenberg and Rick Majerus. Just love the energy of those guys, you know, and they're proven winners. Oh, yeah, Rick Majerus. Rick Majerus is one of the best coaches of his era, easily. Yeah, yeah. Especially to be at a program like Utah and, and make them a national powerhouse. You know what I'm right. saying? Because since then, Utah. have they really <laughs> been a powerhouse? Not really, no. right? So um, so now you got NBA dreams, I, I assume, right? So you, you make Always the decision that, that you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not messing with the new coach. They, 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 they did your guy dirty. So was it as simple as, okay, well, I, I can't go to another school. I'm going to try and put my name in the draft is it like you know what i mean because i'm sure yeah. you had some kind of interest leading the nation in blocks some kind of was there any contact from any kind of because because back then is way different than now right yeah. yeah so that i'm just very curious like did they did you have any idea that you would even be drafted or that you were like on the radar of any nba teams i knew i was on the radar but there were still questions because you know i was an alcoholic Oh, you and know, they knew this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. They know everything about you. Right. Okay. You know, things that okay. you think are G14 classified, they know. <laughs> got you. you know? They got a lot of money. So, yeah. Exactly. For the right price, they're going to find out what they want, I suppose. Exactly. Right. You know, so uh, I, they were, you know, the word was that I was a project if anybody would take me, but physically, they didn't think I was ready for the demands of, of the NBA. Especially back then. At, at that time, I was about 210 pounds, soaking wet. You know, and uh, they they didn't know how my body would stand up to it. Right, right. You know, so I ended up playing uh, 12 games in the ABA, the Atlantic Basketball Association. Okay, you know, and I'm glad you brought that up because people don't even know, other than the G League, people don't know North America's got a lot. The America's got a lot of basketball, which I'm sure you could shed a light yeah, on, right? Absolutely, what, man. What other leagues have you played in? I played in the CBA, the Continental Basketball Association, okay. which, you know, a lot of guys came from. You know, John Starks from the New York Knicks, he started there. Right. A, a lot of a lot of very talented players started right. in those leagues and then got their, you know, their chance with the NBA a few years later. Right. You know, um, also played in the, the USBL, the United States Basketball League with okay. the Pennsylvania Valley Dogs. Um, at that time, it was the second best pro- professional league in the United States okay. behind the NBA. Which people don't know, I'm and, sure. Right, right. I played for a guy uh, by the name of Chocolate Thunder, Daryl Dawkins. There, he was my coach. Phil W. 76's yeah, legend? Yeah. And uh, guys like Terrence Roberson, who played at Fresno State, you know, Michigan, Fresno State. 
uh, Quincy Wildley from Temple, Tunji Ojobi from Boston University, Kareem Reed, who played at Arkansas, best kept secret as he's known as. He from, you know, the Bron- uh, from Brooklyn. From the Bronx. Is he from the Bronx? No, he's from Brooklyn. Okay. Pretty sure. He was, a le- he was a legend because he used to play in Rucker when he was like in high school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, left-handed. He's not even six feet tall. Yeah, Reams maybe 5'9 at most. Yeah, you he's, know, he he's incredible. One of the smartest point guards I ever played with. You yeah, know, he's and it was a lot of fun playing with that dude. And he was going to make you raise your game. And that's been back when Arkansas just had won some national titles. So that's right. not the Arkansas you know today. So he was, he was exactly. an amazing basketball player. So. Exactly. Then we had this little tank. You know, Tim Wynn from uh, St. Bonaventure, another mm-hmm. five eight five nine little tank. You know, a little strong guy. Ace Custis, you know, A-10 player of the year at Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. Uh, Franz Pierre-Louis, I can't remember where Franz went to school. But also Olden Polonese eventually oh, joined, a, okay. joined the team down the line. You know, so we had so many talented Got Corey Hightower out of Michigan, out of Flint. He was viewed as a left-handed Kobe at one point, mm-hmm. you know. So, so much talent, man, with these guys. And we, we played against talent. Uh, guys like Terrence Shannon, who's a high flyer, had a long, successful career over overseas. Uh, Lee Benson, 6'10", 6'11", you know, do-it-all, big man. Okay. You know, who became a legend internationally, you know, especially over in China. You know, still holds several records in the CBA for – scoring and rebounding in the game, you know, gotcha. well, rebounds especially because now the scoring's been so, you know, they have guys that have been really filling it up lately. But uh been blessed and fortunate to play with some very, very talented guys who were at one point in time household names. You know, they didn't – maybe they didn't make it to the NBA, but what they did in high school, what they did in college, you know, they deserve to be there. They definitely deserve to be there. No, and it's and it's nice of you to remember all those names because you know it was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and to bring those guys up and just shed light on you know just because you weren't a star doesn't mean that you weren't nice. Um, right. Every there's only room for a couple stars. Exactly. And speaking of stars, you mentioned Kobe, and and you have a, a unique experience because you got to coach Kobe and yeah. play with Kobe. Yeah. Why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Coaching with coaching Kobe at the ABCD camp. Which was the biggest camps back then, that and Five yeah. Star. Um, yeah, yeah, for, exactly. For, uh, us old guys. Exactly. <laughs> that's where you, you know, wanted to be. Yeah, that's that's where you wanted to be if you were one of the, if you considered yourself one of the top talents in high school basketball. You know, I didn't. I never made it to any of those camps. You know, uh, my plateau was the West Coast All Star Camp by the Pump Brothers. Okay. You know, David and Dana. Shout out to them. Uh, but yeah, coaching Kobe. You know, there are other players there. Tim Thomas. Uh, Tim Thomas was there, Kobe, Jermaine O'Neal, and another five-star player at that time, Lester Earl. Okay. Who was from the South, a 6'9", do-it-all kid who was really supposed to blow up. And Tim Thomas is amazing, by the way. Tim, yeah, yeah. He was one of the best yeah. high school players I've ever seen uh, out of New Jersey. He was Tim is unstoppable. Underrated. He's one of the best New Jersey high school players of all time, for yeah. sure. Um, and he's definitely under an underrated, underrated player. for yeah. sure. A 6'10 stretch, you know. So how did you go from coaching Kobe, though, then to playing with Kobe? How did that happen? So the next year, I entered the NBA draft. Well, two years later, I I actually entered the NBA draft. And I go undrafted. Now, that night, I've got calls. You know, mind you, I've done the pre-draft camps with Seattle, you know, Chicago, Miami. So I had made my rounds throughout, you know, a couple teams in the league. And folks were calling me, preferably, you know, uh, Seattle and Philadelphia, they were calling me draft night telling me, hey, man, I think we're going to get you with this with this next pick. So, okay, great. You know, I'm excited because now my dream is really, you know, about to become a reality. Okay. Um, and each and every time they, you know, drafted somebody else. And it was like, oh, wow, okay, well, cool. You know, good for whoever it is they just drafted. Um, and then at the end of the night, I'm sitting there and my name goes uncalled. You know, I got pissed off. You know, of course you I, did. I was very offended because I knew that I had the talent to compete with these guys. You know, all right, I didn't go to the major Division One university, but when we did play the major D one schools, I went ahead and did my thing. You know, I didn't always have good offensive outputs at times, but defensively, I, I showed up each and every night for my team. I hate getting scored on, and I hate for my teammates to get scored on. 
So that's why I was able to get so many, so many blocks out there. Gotcha. You know, uh, but the Lakers after the draft, you know, the Lakers called and you know invited me to join the summer pro league. So that's okay. how I ended up playing with Kobe two years later. You That's know. an oh right because he went straight out of high school. Yeah. So so just so people understand the context, when you coach him at the ABCD camp, he was still in high school and you were in college. Yeah. But because he came straight out of high school, y'all ended up in the league at the same time. Right. Well, he ended up a year before me. Got you. But yeah. of course, he was still a young up and coming player. And back right. then, you still played in the summertime, uh, unlike unlike today. Yeah. I mean, even LeBron played in summer league once upon a time. So right, uh, it's changed a lot. Um, so let's get to. Um, your NBA journey mm-hmm. was it everything you expected to be and more, or was it a disappointment? And I asked that question because you know people know the Clippers today, but if you're younger than 25 years old, uh, you might not know that w- when Mr. Kloss played for the Clippers, they weren't only the worst team in the NBA; they might have been the worst professional organization in, in America. History. Yeah, literally. Yeah, absolutely. So, man. what was that like? It was. It was a serious reality check, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know. Okay. I mean, I love the fact that I was able to get out there with the best in the world, with the elite of the world. Of course. You know, uh, my first preseason game, Shaq's down at the other end, you know. Was, and that's when it That's really, a reality check and a half right really there, boy. That's when it really got real, <laughs> you know, because I'm looking down there and this behemoth of a guy, you know, looked like he was about to bust out the back of that shooting <laughs> top, you know. Right. Playing for the team that I loved growing up. Of course. And now I'm with the other guys. And uh but then it was like, you know what, fuck them. You know, 'cause if you if you can't if you can't join them, beat them. And so that's the mentality I had. You know, I'll do my I'll do my part to try to beat these guys. And it was like that for whichever team that we played against, you know. I had a chip on my shoulder because I wanted to prove to each and every team, you know, to why they're wrong on passing me up on draft night. As you should. You know, and uh, I signed a $8.5 million contract, you know, for an undrafted rookie free agent. Which Back was, then. Yeah, which was unheard of, you know, uh, especially for a guy from a small school. Right. You know, and then it came to the part where, damn, big men aren't really shooting outside of, you know, 10 feet from the basket. You know, and here I I have extensive range on my jump shot. Not only do I have range on my jump shot, but I can handle the ball pretty well, you know. Like how they do today. Yeah, exactly. But we were we were expected to be back to the basket, you know, and just plotting and, you know, bowling over each other, you know, bruisers. And that just wasn't my style of play. Could I adapt to it? Yes. Did I want to? No. You know, work smarter, not harder. Right. So, um, I was all about using my advantages, my strengths to my advantage, you know, and and using that against the opposition. But the coaches, they had other ideas. <laughs> of course, and I, I I balked, you know, naturally I balked. Let them know my displeasure with it, and I didn't realize now the game had, you know, that I love so much and grew up playing for free had officially become a business. Your job. Yeah. Yeah, right. because now there's a big time paycheck coming, you know, every two weeks, you know, and I can't just do my thing out there because I have to do the thing that the that the coach wants for the success of the team. With right, you know, we didn't have much, but as far as the success part, but. no, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, you're not going to come in as an undrafted rookie and get your way. You got to right. adapt, or you're going to be gone. So your reality was different than than you know what I mean. Say like Kobe Bryant, for example. Yeah. So, yeah. Because um, I damn sure thought that I'd be able to get out there and do my thing, you know, especially with the money that they're paying me. Now I get to prove why they've given me this money, you know, because there are a lot of questions. What did this guy do? Okay, he led the nation in blocks, but what else did he do? Right. So if you didn't see me play at the summer pro league, you had no idea. Exactly. You know, and our games weren't televised you know so not, at least not nationally we were lucky to get a regional game every once in a while God, yeah. you know uh, so I felt like I had a lot to prove and I was more than willing to prove it of course you know of course so in most of the interviews I've seen of you and you know just obviously doing my research everyone always wants to talk about your gang affiliations back mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. being from where you're from it's something that you know today 
we got professional athletes that claim to be part of some, but it seems like that only happened after they become pro- professional athletes, which is kind of impossible mm-hmm. because if you didn't get brought up in it, you're not getting put in it in, 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 when you're rich. That, that, that doesn't make no right. sense. Right, doesn't make any sense at all. At all. Right. Now, in your case, it's something that you always around, um, and then you went to the NBA, but you didn't. you didn't separate yourself from that part of your life. Right. Do you believe that if you would have signed – with a team on the other coast, maybe not in Connecticut because you're from there too. Not so not in the tri-state area, maybe like you know, like a Oklahoma City, for example, like somewhere just far away from where you're from. Because every city has gang culture, right? But again, now that you're in the NBA, you're not going to go looking for that. Right. Whereas when you sign with the Clippers, you're in your own backyard. Do you think that had a huge effect, or do you think that your mentality at that time? you were going to find a path or the you would have chosen the wrong path because of all the things you've been through? That's a that's a great question. You know, and honestly, I, I thought about that in the past. You know, what if I had actually signed a play, you know, in Charlotte? Right. Or, you know, or what if I played in Miami or Cleveland, Atlanta? Would things be different? There's no real way to tell, to be honest. Right, right. You know, um, and I was the type of person that always found my way back to my comfort zone, which was some hood shit. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, that was my comfort zone. You know, of course, I can go ahead and, and hang out with the corporate people, right. you know, and fit in just fine because I know how to articulate myself. Mm-hmm. And then I, I'm also fluent in Ebonics. Right. So with that, you know, I still found I still managed to find my way right back to the hood of whatever city I happen to be visiting. You know, uh, there was also a thing with, you know, uh, when keeping it real goes wrong. Dave you know, Chappelle. And yeah, and I'm a prime example of that, you know, because I didn't want to be one of those guys. I didn't want to be looked at by my peers as one of those guys who made it, just got the hell on and turned his back on everybody, you know, mm-hmm. because I I heard the rumblings about people who did that. I heard how people in the community felt about that, and I didn't want to be looked at like that. Right. You know, so... I still maintain my affiliations. I still show that, okay, I'm the one that's making the money. The money isn't making me, you know, and regardless of how much they're paying me, I'm still who I am and I'm still where I'm from, you know, and I still love the people from my community. So they're not going to keep me away no matter what they do, you know. Uh, But yeah, shit doesn't always work out the way that you think it's going to. Hindsight you is know, always twenty twenty, right? It's, right? it's easy. It's easy right. to speculate. But it just made me think, like, it was so so easy for you to fall back into that because of where you were. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you were somewhere different in a better organization, that would have used you properly. You know what I'm saying? Things might have worked out, but there's no you can't change the past. You can only look forward. So um, looking forward, you've been coaching basketball recently. Are you still, Is that still something that you're uh, going to continue for the last to do? Seven years. So. Okay. Yeah. And, and how's that been going for you? How's that transition been? You know what? It's been great. It's been great. Overall, my best experience was in China. Wow. You okay. Know, that was my best experience where I had uh, the most talented players. Okay. You know, where they were really, really serious and basketball junkies, you know. Which helps. Uh, yeah, yeah, which definitely helps. You know, in Turkey, I had a pretty good experience out there as well. Got a chance to work with some great people who were like-minded in, in terms of actually being teachers of the game. Right. You know, not using any of that gimmicky shit that they, you know, you see trainers doing now, and like the plastic bag over the basketball. When you <laughs> just – ball's going to get wet, fine. But, you know, it'll right, get right. wet naturally with the – Wash your hands. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, sweaty hands. So, uh, but, you know uh, – being here, it's been more of a challenge because this, Costa Rica's not known for basketball. Right. And so it's not taken seriously, you know, and at least not by everybody. I, there's a maybe a good 5% of the coaches that I know here who take it serious and the rest is just something for them to do. It's past time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's not that passion for it. And so they're, you know, the majority don't know how to really uh, – get the most out of their players um yeah it's it's interesting it's it's i've had the same experiences i used to coach back home um and that's its own story but 
if you love the game, you're going to figure out how to do it and, and how to always be involved. Because I've been involved uh, with, with a few teams here. Uh, I wanted to get get your perspective on a couple of things. So uh, you had a famous incident, or maybe it's not famous to some people, but infamous to others, mm-hmm. uh, with, with with a gentleman that other people know uh, by the name of Lamar Odom, someone who I saw play in high school basketball who was a unicorn back then. Yeah. He was literally was a six-foot-nine point guard in high school. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable player who, who has had his own off-the-court issues. Uh, you want to elaborate on the incident that you had with him? How did that go down? Jesus. Why did you guys have a problem in the first place? Well, he was, you know, we got to chalk it up to uh, immaturity. Okay. You know, immaturity, man. And, you know. Just picking on young guys, basically. No, no. no. Not even? There was no picking on anything. That's like me, you know, called. Okay. Let, how would you feel if I called your girl at 2, 3 in the morning? Telling I don't know. Her, uh, now you're looking for a fight. Like, yes. Yeah, that's that's yeah. not picking so, on somebody. That's, that's, that's just straight up disrespect. Right. Okay. Right. And so the disrespect had to be addressed, you know, and it happened around the time where, you know, there was some, some uh, altercations with a couple of other guys. And, you know, my cup had runneth over with frustration. And I, I said, OK, fuck it. This is what it is. Now I got to let them know what time it is for real. You know, and it was something that I tried to shy away from. You know, because I just wanted to concentrate on basketball and just have fun playing basketball. But when you're playing for the Clippers and, you know, you're having these these uh, altercations or disagreements with several teammates in, almost in rapid succession, mm-hmm. you know, I just – I was just at my wits' end with it. And you know, I made a terrible – at the end of the day, it was a terrible decision, a cowardly decision, you know. But I made it nonetheless. Right, right. You know, and uh, because at the time it made the most sense to really get my point across right then and there, you know. Yeah, it's an unfortunate incident. I'm sure he regrets it, Um, you know. And I'm sure, you know, back then, young guys, a lot of money. You know, you're from the hood. Lamar ain't from Beverly Hills. Lamar was right. from the from the projects in Queens. Right, right. He had you know a rough upbring- upbringing as well. Exactly. So, yeah. so um, I'm sure that the money, the testosterone, the the egos, because and I'm sure he ain't the only person that you probably clash with, just because that's just how it, what you are as young men. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. You, your teammates are the people that that ride on you the hardest sometimes. You know what I mean? Because they mm-hmm. know everything about you. So yeah. Uh, but now the 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 calling your girl. I mean, I, I'm not saying what you did was right, but I feel I, I understand why you, you guys would have a problem because that's yeah. not, that's not him cracking jokes. Right. That's him crossing the line. Right. Right. So I mean, first he he approached me about it on a road trip, and you know, and I laughed it off. You know, and I, uh, young fella, you crazy. You know. Right. Right. But then when I got wind of the phone calls, that's when okay, it hit another level. You know, now this is where the dis- okay. First it was cute. Right now, yeah. and if you don't address it, he's not going to be the last person to do it. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, I, I understand totally. So, uh, and we want to make sure it's the last time he ever thinks about doing it. So. <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> argue with that, bro. Uh, wanted to ask you, as and at least in my opinion, the first man to ever go viral. You have the you have the first viral video of all time. Yeah, I promise you. There was no social media. There was no such thing as viral videos back then. Um, I don't know as much about that incident as I should just because I was around at that time and I saw the video that like right when it happened. Mm-hmm. But I'm one of those type of people, bro. I don't I don't like encourage foolishness, right? So right. the video you know says, Oh, uh NBA player gets into a fight. You didn't get into a fight, you got jumped. Yeah, I got jumped. You yeah. got jumped. So explain to us how you even got put in that situation. I'm gonna and I'm gonna ask you, were you sober? On a scale from like, on a scale from like one to Wolf of Wall Street, how how intoxicated were you in the, during that incident? I wasn't yet. You weren't even. So you were sober. Yeah. So so let me stop talking. How did you, how did that go down? What what got you there? We were initially we were at another at another club in Hollywood and uh, ran into my son's mom there and I, you know our son was two months old at the time so I had a problem with her being there instead of you know hey you could have called me and. I would have stayed home with them. Okay. You know, if you want to go out, fine, but let me know. That way I can go ahead and change. I'll drop everything I'm doing, you know, for my son. That's just the type of dad I am. Um, and, you know, words were exchanged, and she acted like she didn't know me, and 
was, oh, okay, we're going to play that game. And I ended up grabbing a microphone at that first place and uh, shout out to DJ Twin, Two Shorts Cousin, because he was a DJ that night, gave me the microphone, lowered the music. I made an announcement and, you know, ran her out of there. Uh, got the crowd involved in it, you know, a little chanting going on, and she ran out of there, you know, embarrassed. And I left and went to another location about 10 minutes later. Keyshawn Johnson was uh, having a uh, birthday party there. Keyshawn and I, we had the same agent at one point in time. So I went to support him for his birthday, and we pull up, and she's standing there in line waiting to get in. And we have our altercation you know, our verbal, and uh, some some guys who were standing nearby didn't like how I was talking to her and, uh, you know, inserted himself into our argument and, yeah, yeah, put on his cape and everything. And, you right, know, right, right. and it just escalated from there. He turned out to be part of a, a rival neighborhood and, you know, got, uh -oh. and, yeah, yeah. And so it elevated very quickly, you know, to some street stuff. And uh, you know, fight or flight, I'm not, I'm not gonna run, I'm not right. turn it down. Well, I seen people trying to pull you back into the car and yeah. all that in the video. Yeah, yeah. There are several people who tried to pull me back, and you know, man, just leave, and because now another line has been crossed, you know, and I, and the way I was raised, and the people who raised me, you know, I now I have to answer that call. And I have to answer with, you know, I have to match the energy or surpass the energy, you know. And so it was perfect when the when the guy initially sucker punched me, when I looked away, I had, it was, excuse me, that was right up my alley, <laughs> you know. It was all great, yes, you know, right. because I, I grew up loving to fight. Right, right, right. So, and I hadn't had a fight in a while. So, you know, it was like, ah, oh, perfect, yes, now I get to take it out on this dude. But I didn't know there were 18 other dudes, you know, who were waiting to get a piece of me as well. My and, mentality, you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah. And by the time you're in, it's like, oh, well, you know. Right, right. How yeah. bad were you hurt from the incident? I wasn't. Right, because that usually happens, right? Because they're just, you just balled up. No, I had, I ended up getting one guy up underneath me. And I, I swear, <laughs> I wanted to bash his head into the ground, yeah. you know. But <laughs> when you're getting kicked and punched from so many right, different right. directions and so many different sets of feet. Well, you don't you know, kick fist, you in the head or the face. You right? know, you, it, it kind of throws off your constant, your, your focus. Right. You know, so before I could even do anything to him, to him, uh, some other people had started pulling people away and they just dispersed and I got in the back of the truck and we took off. You know, but, uh, yeah. Man, that's enough about that, bro. Because um, I that that's some coward shit. They, you know, like 10, 12 dudes jumped you. So, like, if one dude wants to square off, that's one thing. Yeah. If his homeboy want to help, because oh, you, you're big, so what? Once it's like double digits, which is nonsense. You know what I'm right, saying? So, right. Uh, that that's why I never researched in more into what happened because I just looked at it and I was like, this is ridiculous. Man. Yeah. You know what I mean, a lot so, of people they made assumptions about what had happened, and right. you know. And then when they when they hear the truth, they're like, "Oh, wow, really?" And, you oh, were just yeah, kind of doing the right thing, and it just went left. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, hmm. I got obviously being a professional, a former professional player, former NBA player, because uh, I've heard, I've seen people in comments in some of your videos like, "Oh, this guy only played 130 games." Right, bro. There's been less than 4,400 people to ever play in an NBA game. In case people didn't know that, so you're part of a very, very exclusive club of people just kind of want your opinion do you have any contenders anyone that you like in the nba any team that you think is gonna I'm you know really 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 surprised at the success that the la clippers are having okay you know the culture there has changed dramatically you know from night to day you know compared to when i played um, exactly i mean how was donald sterling i mean that could be a whole other interview so maybe you might want to hold off on that <laughs> but any any incidents with with, with sterling, Mr. Sterling? sterling sterling made it uh pretty interesting you know and pretty stressful to, to play for him because basketball wasn't his passion we know this. Know, and his passion was more along the lines of uh liberace <laughs> you know he was a liberace of the nba you know, okay, he, I mean, he was just interested in. So I just had like seven jokes go through my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just inter he was just interested in you know staring at naked black bodies in the locker room. Right, 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 right. You right. know, and and making passes at guys. 
You know, that right. that right. excited him more than if we won a game. You know, he could care less if we were winning games. He could care less if we were happy, you know. And there were more than several inappropriate uh, situations in that locker room that, you know, surrounding him and th- the way he talked to us, the way he approached us, you know, and that – and any one of those moments could have gone left as well, you know, where he could have found himself, you know, laid out because of a player, you know, you, you can't creep up behind a guy when he's bent over putting on his underwear. Uh, I, I don't think I need to add anything to that. So uh, I made you go off track because I couldn't yeah. not bring up Dolan Sterling. But, <laughs> but again, you, your thoughts on the Clippers. They're, they're, Hey, Steve Ballmer's done a great job. He really Amazing. cares, right. you know, and he's showing it. He's he's getting guys who are, who are, you know, guys are finally feeling like they belong in the NBA, like they're a part of the NBA. Excuse me. Okay. They being a part of the Clippers now is being a part of the NBA, you know, because it wasn't like that before. Right. You know, um, it used to be just a place where guys would pass through on their way to the next big contract. You know, or on their way out. Right. right. It was never a, a, a preferred destination, but now it is. You know, uh, especially with the success that they were able to have with Chris Paul and the Lob, you know, even the Lob City guys. The, you know, and then the guys that came a couple years after me, Quentin Richardson, Darius Miles. You know, the things Corey Maggette, Elton Brand, the things that those guys were able to do in changing the culture. That was when the culture started to change. Right. right you right. know, for the Clippers, adding guys like Catino Mobley. Right, you know, right, right. proven vet, you know, to lead that team. Um, they've definitely surprised me because for years we thought that they would always be at the cellar, you know. And this addition this year of James Harden, I didn't know how it was going to work out because honestly, he's he's quit on every other organization he played for. Right, right. And we didn't want to see him, you know, get to LA and do the same thing to the Clippers, you know. But now they're in first in the West. You know, and uh, a lot of people are actually seriously looking at them as championship contenders. You know, if if guys can, if the key guys can stay healthy during the playoffs, you know, when they're needed the most, that's that's a game changer right there. Because every other year where they've had success, you know, in the last ten years, once they get to the playoffs, there would be a key injury. You know, whether it was Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, you know, one of those Kawhi recently, you know, somebody, a key figure always ended up getting hurt and that would just destroy everything, you know. So if these guys can can stay healthy and they can stay consistent, if they can stay healthy and stay consistent, they can, you know, I, I, I see them competing for the uh, for the West. I think they can win the whole thing if they're healthy, but that's the biggest if in the entire league. They're, them and health do not uh, go hand in hand to say right. the least, right? So um, you've had a, a, an amazing life, a lot of experiences, been through a lot. I'm a, it's, I think I'm just happy to say that, you know, the fact that you're still involved in basketball is the best part of your story. So, you know, thank you for coming through. Hopefully we see you again. Honor and and we appreciate you, bro. Be safe, be well. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.